And this show is about hope and happiness. So there's no gossip, no scandal. <laughs> Instead, I want you to focus on your own reality show and how you can be happy 88% of the time. So I have shows and topics. Sunday, Monday, happy days. Tuesday, Wednesday, happy days. Thursday, Friday, happy days. Monday, Tuesday, happy days. Wednesday, Thursday, happy days. Friday, whatever, happy days. What a day. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Best known as the mom from Happy Days. And she is a delightful 89 year young Marion Ross to my studio. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Dr. Marissa, <laughs> this is such a treat for me. Oh. My goodness, you're a wonderment. Which is exactly the kind of guest that I like. Those who have gone through life, good and bad, and then taken those experiences to alchemize them into the person they are now and doing good on the planet. I'd like you to welcome Corey Feldman. If you're grateful for it and you say right away, thank you, God. Oh, my God, that's so beautiful. I'm so blessed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Then guess what? More good things will come to you. Does this sound familiar at all? <laughs> <laughs> She's back again to mark my Cancer Awareness and Prevention Month show. Please welcome Fran Drescher. Hi, I'm Fran. And supporting Cancer Schmanz. I really yes. appreciate so it. So what would you say are some of the biggest myths, Fran, that people have about cancer? Well, I would say that they think that there's a cure for it. <laughs> okay. Instead of a cause for it. is the first call-in show when I get to be Dr. Marissa, the kinder, gentler Dr. Laura. And uh, people call in to get their life tires balanced and their critical thinking or their BS, their belief systems, smog checked. And today I am delighted to have Malie calling in from Birmingham, Alabama. We could go 90 days and end up having terrible sex. And then you say, well, the relationship's not all about sex. Well, if I'm not getting great sex from you, then I'm going to get it from somebody else. Right? That moose just got put on the table. <laughs> 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 and I see Josh and Jim. I have to agree You're with both nodding, nodding, nodding. Ramon's sort of half nodding because his wife's listening. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I understood what was going to happen if I, Muhammad Ali's youngest daughter, made public that I was going to become a boxer. So mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure this was the path that I wanted to go down. You are absolutely fabulous, beautiful inside and out. And I'm giving you Dr. Mercy's Beneficial Presence on the Planet Award today. Thank you. When I go, I'm gone. Are you lonely? No. No, nah, I knew that was going to be But I, I surround myself with people. I mean, I'm always the one cooking for things. But I'm always the one that decorates first and come to my house. All the orphans that have no place. I'm going to have no place to go. So okay, come okay, over. come on over. <laughs> Life is so amazing if we can see it. Jump off that exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. I promise you joy in the mystery. Dr. Marissa, also known as the Asian Oprah. Her mission, to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose, to be your personal advocate to live, laugh, love, learn. Her life motto, 
Don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marisha Pay. And welcome. You are tuned in to Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. The morning show here on CNBC News, NBC News Radio, and NBC Sports. KCAA, home to the Asian Oprah, AM 1050, FM 106.5, and streaming everywhere. iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, Audible, Amazon Music, Podchaser, Geosan, Tiki Live, Rumble, and more. <laughs> it's about 28 more that I haven't had enough coffee to recite. And why so many places? Because I want to maximize my splatter zone for more hope and happiness. Because life is way too short to be walking around saying, life sucks. Instead, I want you to focus on your own reality show, not the K-words, not the Kardashians, not the Kanye's or whatever he's calling himself. I want you to focus on your own reality show and how you can be happy 88% of the time. So I have topics and guests to that end. If you missed Layla Ali's second time on my show, you can go to my YouTube channel, free subscribe, get that as well as tons of different interviews with so many interesting people and Today, I have an interesting person for you as well. His name is, well, you, uh, you, may, well, you may have already recognized him because he is a uh, very, uh, a working actor. He's not a waiter. And uh, he has done many movies, I think 20 movies now. He is going to be in the upcoming movie, which is why he's on here called A Man Called Otto, and one of my favorite actors is going to be uh, in the movie with him, <laughs> Tom Hanks. You may know who he is, and I'm just so delighted that he is able to come and talk to me, and I'm sure I'll be asking him any background stuff on Tom. But uh, before we do that, I have uh, um, Peter. Peter Lawson Jones is his name. I have a, I don't have an answering machine. I have a questioning machine. <laughs> so when you call me, it says, who are you and what do you want? So Peter Lawson, who are you and what do you want? Well, I am Peter Lawson Jones. I am the proud son of Charles and Margaret Jones. Uh, my dad was a Tuskegee Airman and played the Negro Baseball League. Uh, my mom was a Cleveland public school teacher and then a truant officer for her professional career. I'm their proud son. Uh, my dad is my hero, my mom, my shero through this very day. I'm also uh, the husband of uh, Lisa Payne Jones, who's endured me for 37 years. And we are the proud parents of Ryan. Leah and Evan. As a matter of fact, I met you because I was in the elevator um, that in the apartment complex that you and my daughter share. So that just uh, a, a little cautionary note to always be on your best behavior because you <laughs> never know where a chance <sighs> in an elevator may lead. But you know, I've, I've, had, I've been so blessed and fortunate during the course of my life. Uh, when I think about it, when I was 10 years old, uh, if somebody asked me what I want to do, I would have told them I want to be a professional baseball player because, you mm. know, red blooded American kid didn't want to be a professional athlete. Uh, I wanted to become an actor and I wanted to become an, a politician. And so I've been fortunate. Uh, I'm an attorney and I have a consulting practice, but I was an elected official in Northeast Ohio for 22 years. And uh, I started acting about 15 years ago, I hadn't acted for 30 years between law school and the time that I started back up again in uh, 2008, I believe it was. Uh, so I've had an opportunity to fulfill several life uh, dreams. So I'm, uh, you know, I, I know you aspire to make sure people are happy 88% of the time. I'm a high achiever. I'm trying to do 90%, 92%. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're like an well, I, I call them recovering overachievers. <laughs> so I don't know how recovered you are, but what uh, a wonderful. Well, well, that's a great question. Uh, because yes. in response to the second part of your query, you ask, what do I want? 
two things. One is to continue to build my legacy and to do that through my children and family, to do that through tangible items that I'll I will leave behind, whether it's a play I've written, because I'm also a playwright. I've written three plays, working on my fourth, uh, a film I'm in, um, and uh, a program that I started while I was an elected official. And, and also the third means is through how do I, how have I impacted the lives of others outside of my family? Have I given, have I given them something that has sustained them, that's made their life better, that's made them more optimistic and hopeful? So those are the three ways that I define legacy. And the other thing I want out of life is to stay relevant until my very last breath. I don't mm. want people to have to ask ever, whatever happened to Peter Lawson Jones. I want them to, to be well aware of the things that I'm involved in and the good that I'm trying to do and the way that I continue to once again, build legacy. Well, thank you very much, Peter Lawson Jones for a very thorough answer uh, that I wouldn't expect your your lawyer is showing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't help it. And you actually went uh, got an undergrad and your law degree from Harvard. So that's no easy feat right there. Um, it makes well, me... I, I, like, I, like, I like to say that they just had open seats those years and they had to fill them. So why not me? Oh, stop. You're you're being uh, humble now, uh, but uh, it is a it is an interesting journey. You're like me. You juice your life, and you have told anyone who said to you, "You can only be good at one thing in your lifetime." You um, you you've done way more than one thing in in your lifetime. You've actually uh, had several careers already. Uh, one, you started, you said you came back to acting, so you were acting. Uh, you, you wanted to be a baseball player. See if I was listening now. You and were. then you were an elected official. Tell me a, a bit more about that one. Oh, sure. And, and you know, in, in many respects, it was amongst the most fulfilling work that I've ever done because you have an opportunity on a day in, day out basis to positively impact somebody's life through a phone call, through a letter of recommendation mm. through establishing a program that uh, that is needed. So I started off as a councilman and then vice mayor, which is the equivalent of council president in Shaker Heights, Ohio. I then went on to serve uh, two and a half terms in the Ohio House of Representatives. And then I was elected county commissioner of one of the, what was then the largest county in the state of Ohio. Now, and why did, oh, so go ahead, sorry. I thought you were. I thought you were done. Oh no, 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 no. please. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, we're both so shy that I can tell that there's going to be a lot of dead uh, silence. Oh, in absolutely. This, uh, in, in this the audience will be absolutely bored as a consequence of this. One. <laughs> absolutely. I'm going to interrupt for one second. Can you just tilt your camera a little bit so I get you right in the middle of the screen? The screen. That would be, well, yeah, because I don't want your name to be covering your mouth. I'll so we got to right do that, that. better? That's better. You, the camera itself won't move. Let's see what we can do. There we go. Okay. There we go. All yes. Right. Yes, because because you're you know you're you're uh, I would you you're nothing bad to look at. Let's just oh. put it. <laughs> Wait, you know, as as a guy who will have a milestone birthday a week from today, that is the highest of comment. You have made my year. You ah. made my ne my next decade with that comment. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know you use oil of Olay like I do, ah. and I am actually ageless. So, but what That's I, I have to be. Now, now I I have to be honest. And what's your wife's name? Lisa. Lisa. So, Lisa, please do not take this as anything but a compliment. And I'm sure he's more lucky to have you than 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 you are to have him. I could have said so, it better myself. So, and, and nor could but she. But when have I said saw him, I'm sorry. What? Nor what could she that? have said it better than you did. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can only imagine the kind of strength she must have to keep up with you. Absolutely. So, so there you go. But uh, the reason why 
your husband is on my show is uh, because when I saw him in the elevator, I went, mm, like I wouldn't kick him out of bed for eating crackers. And then uh, started talking and then like he had me at uh, Tom Hanks. I mean, good looking and everything, but Tom Hanks, he had me at Tom Hanks. And then we're talking. And then I said, you, I hope you're not married. No, (laughs) no, that's not, no. I said, I hope you're single. I said, I hope you're single too. And he goes, no, I'm happily married for how many years? And I'm like, well, I already invited him on for an interview. I can't very well, can't retract that. that. (laughs) So in all, you know, putting the moose on the table, which is my Canadian version of the elephant in the room, I have to be honest about how this all happened. But I think it's wonderful because I am truly uh, one. I collect people who live by the rules that I do, which is in this particular case, you juice your life. People say to me, why do you do so many things? I mean, there's just like, do you ever relax? Do you ever stop? And the answer is no, because I can relax when I go to the other side. You know, when we're at that end of the apostrophe, birth and death, I can sleep forever, literally. But uh, I don't get do-overs. So I want to um, be the person to stop that stupid adage of um, jack of all trades, master of none. That is bull shiitake. You can be a master at anything you put your mind and heart to uh, by loving it, enjoying it, not worrying about it, honing it. Uh, gospel according to Nike, just do it anyways when you don't feel like practicing. But you can have multiple careers. This man is living proof of that. I'm living proof of that. So kudos to you. Well, I, I believe in reinvention and renaissance. It was kind of interesting. I had a friend of mine, um, he was asking me what I'd been up to and I was sharing it with him. He said, well, you are having a fine act three. And I said, hold on a second. I'm just in act two, and this is a five-act play. It's Nicholas Nickleby. And so, <laughs> so I'm just getting started. Somebody introduced me a couple of weeks ago when I was making a presentation, and they said, yeah, I just read this uh, article about you are the man of, of with nine lives. And so my response was, well, please just tell me which life I'm in so I'll know how, where I have to speak <laughs> in over the last couple. But you know, I, I think of myself as a shark, you know, a shark. Uh, when it ceases to move, then it dies. So I just try to stay busy, keep engaged. I'm already thinking what I'm going to do next, what I'm going to do in a decade or so. And I'm, I look forward to that. I, 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 you know, the one word that's not in my vocabulary is retirement. Uh, me neither. No intention. I, what, what fun is that they're in that. I, I mean, I like sports as much as the next guy. I guess I could go play golf, but how many rounds of golf could I play in a, uh, you know, a week before I'm absolutely bored? How much TV could I watch? How many movies could I go to? You know, so I, I just want to stay engaged and, like I said, stay relevant. You are definitely a twin. I know we don't look alike, but the just what you just said there has has been my my life motto, my song. Uh, don't die wondering, no regrets for the past, and I will never retire. I Why would I stop doing everything that what I love to do? What you enjoy doing. What, why exactly. stop doing what you're passionate and excited about? And then uh, there's a song, and, and they may have played in a movie, and maybe many of the listeners are familiar with it. And the primary lyric is, don't let the old man in. And I... Hmm. I, I it just it's a wonderful descriptor especially the older one gets you don't you want to keep the joy of a child the excitement mm. of a child mm-hmm. don't let that old stodgy irritable grumpy guy that wants to keep the kids off his lawn don't let him embody you or become mm-hmm. one, or invade at, at, your soul and yeah. your psychology and psyche Absolutely. I I love that saying, you do not stop laughing because you grow old. 
you grow old because you've stopped laughing. And children laugh on average 400 times a day. Ad adults laugh on average less than 40 times a day. Wow. I think 40 is way too high. Yeah. I know a lot of adults who maybe get four laughs in a day, which is really a shame. Now, now you just talked about that, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. Um, what What's interesting is you just accidentally or accidentally, not accidentally, described uh -huh. the movie that's coming up is about a man who is a, you know, grumpy old man and played by Tom Hanks, who uh, to, to uh, Peter's credit, I said to him jokingly, half jokingly, that uh, you can bring Tom to this interview. And you actually oh. did raise it to Tom Hanks. So I'm on Tom Hanks's radar, which I'm so thrilled. And you just made my year for that. <laughs> he, ha he has an email with your name in it. No. Yes. Wow. So he knows of you. And I love I, it. And I, and I think it's unfair to call you the Asian Oprah Winfrey. I think we're going to have to call Oprah the African-American Dr. Marissa. That's how I feel. I haven't been on her show. So as far as I'm concerned, you're number one. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Hold on. We got to capture that moment right now. And here we go. <laughs> that was perfect. That was perfect. It's funny. I don't know if you know my big brother, Michael Bernard Beckwith. He's no, uh, the founder of Agape. He was one of the teachers from The Secret. He's the one who did the Super Soul Sundays, became one of Oprah's 100 listers. Oprah listens to him. Um, they, they're, they're good friends. And he was the one who introduced me to her as the Asian Oprah. <laughs> so it was not something I called myself. You know, people think I, I made that up. I did not make that up. I was introduced to her and he said, this is the Asian Oprah. And she looked at me, looked down, looked back at me and said, nice pants. <laughs> and it took everything, Peter, not to say, do you want them? <laughs> I mean, it's not every day you get a compliment like oh, that, right? right. Bro, so, so that's yeah. Well, well, well but, let me let me say this: the moment you walked in the elevator, it was clear how stylish and cosmopolitan and gorgeous you were. You know, and, and I don't even think my wife would mind me saying that because it's simply the truth. You better not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you've already said, and I can't edit it. As this is live. <laughs> it's out there. It's out there. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. The feeling's mutual, and we were definitely a match, not made that way, but definitely a twin. You you are very much of like mind and love-heartedness as I am. I want to leave a legacy, too. I do not want to let one minute go by that I would want to do over. So it is, um, and this is, okay, so let's talk a bit for a second about why this is not the norm when it comes to people's ideas about life. Why is it that most people, even before the pandemic, okay, do not feel this way? And, and, and I'm not slamming them because I didn't always feel this way. I mean, I, I went decades where, where I was not happy with life. And I would say life sucks. You know, um, you know, this happened to me bad and that happened and who did who wrong and all of that. So have you so the so the first part of the question is, have you ever had hardship in your life? Did you have like a charmed childhood? And that's why you're doing all the things you're doing. So give me a little bit of that, because it's not every black man that gets into Harvard as an undergrad and as a lawyer in, in law school. So give me a little bit of one, the reality of you, and two, um, what, what, what was so important to you that got you to a place where you have so much joie de vie, so much love for life and wanting to leave a legacy? The first thing, I think I was 
when I say unfortunately more blessed than ever than than far too many children. Um, in that I just had extraordinary parents, loving, nurturing parents, uh, who came up during the Depression, who came up during Jim Crow, uh, who experienced a more virulent form of racism than I ever did, but that who raised me to believe in myself, believe in, frankly, the possibilities of America, believe in what education could deliver, because they were both educators. Um, and so I was filled with a certain faith that could not be destroyed, provided that I did the work. I knew that if I worked hard, if I was diligent and treated people fairly and well, that there was very little that I couldn't achieve. I always, I believed that I could have been president if I really set my mind to it. I mean, that's the way my parents raised me. Uh, and, and, you know, early on, I enjoyed success as, as a student and in a student leader and in other respects. And so to me, the, my horizons were unlimited. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have to credit my parents. And, you know, when I was a, an elected official, I established, I wrote the legislation that created the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. And I also started when I was a Cuyahoga County Commissioner the uh, Cuyahoga County Fatherhood Initiative, because I saw the difference that it made in my life to have uh, both parents and and certainly a father who was as engaged as he was uh, with me, supporting me and inculcating in me a belief in myself and faith in mm -hmm. myself. And I just think every child deserves that. But the truth is that in America and in the world, that's more likely not the case than it is the case. So. Yeah. So, 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 yes, certainly during my life, I've experienced hardship. I mean, I've lost elections. I mean, in the courtroom, I've lost cases. I mean, I've lost loved ones. So I'm not immune to the kinds of things that happen to every other human being that's part of the human condition. And have I had moments of grand defeat where I felt momentarily depressed? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I remember one time I just missed getting appointed to the Ohio State Senate by one vote. I, and, um, and my mom was at my home at the time and she was crushed and I was feeling disconsolate. And then within five minutes, I was talking about, OK, well, this didn't happen, but I can. But this opportunity is going to be available in the next few months or the next year. And she looked at me, she said, you're a, you have you amaze me. She said, you're already kind of optimistic about the future and not dwelling on what happened. Mm -hmm. You ask a very interesting question in terms of why so many people find it difficult to embrace happiness. And I think there's a number of reasons for it. As, uh, one certainly is that they haven't been raised to see the glass is half full. Many people are not grateful. They take the good that happens to them for granted and they dwell on the negative. Um. So it's, it's, it's things that like that to get in the way of their blessings. Also, most people, unfortunately, in my humble estimation, don't tend to be accountable. And they're always looking around the corner for who did them in. And so if something happens in their life, um, they don't get the result they want. They tend to think, OK, who victimized me? Who did something to me so I didn't get that? my perspective has always been to think, what could I have done better? And that's kind of born out of a certain optimism that if I do better, uh, that things that I'm going to achieve a better outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, if the most important message I would give to parents is raise your children with a sense of hope, not with chips on their shoulder. My parents had plenty of reasons to have chips on their shoulder, plenty of reasons to poison me with certain thoughts that would have had me looking for the boogeyman and the villain in everything I did. But instead, they raised me to believe just the opposite, that everything was possible. I, I remember my dad, and this was a great thing about my father. He used to, um, whenever the school year started, whether it was college or law school, he would drive up with me. 
And then when the school year was over, he might take, because I had a little piece of car on campus, and he would uh, fly up or take the train up, and we would drive back together. When I lived and worked in Washington, D.C. for two years, he drove out there with me. When I spent summers in San Francisco and in L.A., we drove across country together. Mm. And at one point I said to him during one of those, probably the last trip, I said, you know, Dad, I finally figured it out that any time I'm off on a, to a new venture, adventure, you're always there to make sure it gets off on the right foot. But it was during one of these trips that I said to him, I said, Dad, you didn't tell me that life could be as challenging, as difficult as it is sometimes. And he said, yeah, that was intentional on your mother and my part. Uh, we didn't want you to feel pessimistic and cynical and we knew you were smart enough to figure out what you needed to figure out to achieve the outcomes that you desired. And I think that's such an important lesson wow. for parents. Don't hamstring and handicap your kids by making them see the glass is half empty. Mm. Be, wow. Courage to view the glass as overflowing, not just half full, overflowing with opportunity. So this is like, this is a huge, I just had this connection. I feel like a transformer right now in my head, because when I, it, when I interviewed Layla Ali, Muhammad Ali's daughter, and she just moved from LA to Georgia, not just, but before the pandemic and her daughter's going to a public school now for the first time. And um, she, you know, uh, witnessed, you know, people being called a monkey and there's not many African-Americans in that school. And so she, as a mom, um, yeah, she had every reason to like go ballistic, right? Around all of that and demand and blah, blah, blah. But she said, you know, I wanted my daughter not to take that on as something that she uh, could own, but instead let her process that through and that we do damage to our children if at too early of an age, we begin to tell them those stories, the truth, right? Like your dad said, it, you know, like you said, he had sufficient reason to tell you about every single time he had been badly discriminated against he grew up in ohio or or in the south oh i mean oh, geez we would have to have uh, uh our interview 2.0 to go into my family's history and, and my dad was born in north carolina and grew up in camden new jersey right across the bridge from philly mm. he you know he found his way to ohio university as a college student and when he was at ou he couldn't this was the late 30s early 40s. He couldn't stay on campus. But there were a group of white Methodist students who had a co-op and they opened up their co-op to dad and another black student. And see, this is the thing. I have seen enough acts and heard about enough acts of kindness from people of different races so that I don't stereotype uh, and I don't have a certain negative expectation if I encounter somebody who's different from me. I don't think negative. They've got to prove themselves to be a villain and an enemy because I give them the full opportunity to show that they can be a good friend and support. Wow. Yeah, this is definitely um, it's a turning point because I've had a lot of shows, of course, when when what happened to George Floyd what happened to, you know, there are some horrific things happening and don't get me wrong. We're still solution focused. We're still looking at what needs to be done to end racism in my lifetime. I will always be hopeful about that. I don't know if I'm realistic about it, but it doesn't matter. But I Stay think there's, don't yeah, worry about there's so, about there's, like there's so much in that because my last uh, guest, Caldwell, uh, Caldwell Williams, he is 88 years old. His grandparents were born slaves in the South. OK, and every time I would bring up something around discrimination and racism, he would expand it and say, you know, um, hurt people hurt people. 
and doesn't matter what race you are. And he kept opening it. And he would not focus on black and brown demise. He just wouldn't do it. And it was such a, I started crying because of his, uh, and we're putting together, I need to talk to you about that, actually. Um, he's, you know, 88, but we have an eight module program to mine his his wisdom so that he leaves that legacy. And I just realized you're the perfect person to talk to about this. But um, he, you know, he may, he and what Layla is saying and what you're saying is having me transform my ideal around how do we get there, not by focusing on the problem and who needs to stop what, but focus on what is being done right now, what is kindness, what is people doing good things, like your the the Methodist group that took your father and 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 his roommate. In. I mean, there is so much good that is being done at this very moment that we don't even talk about. It doesn't make the news because there, the news, you know, you if it bleeds, it, it leads, leads, right? You, I'm sure you've heard of the human library. There's this organization that is a human library. You would love this. You're going to want to go. Where you go in the library and you sit down with people of different color skin and faith and religion and belief systems and you have a conversation with them. That's the library, a human library. I, lo I love that. I've got to go. And let me, yes. let, me, let me say this. Pretty much, we inherit a number of immutable characteristics. Race, gender, certainly for the most part. I mean, obviously, there's some said, but, but for the most part, these are immutable. We, we are born into certain socioeconomic circumstances. We are born into certain religions. Very little of this is things that we, very little of this is things that we choose. And so if you understand that, you understand that we're, we're all born into the same conditions. And, and so how can you take, we think about race seriously or religion seriously, religious differences or racial differences seriously or ethnic differences, because these are not things that we choose. They are things that we are born into. And so don't give them the kind of weight that unfortunately society has over the centuries. Mm -hmm. and that now, mean, you're not saying, though, that there is not the reality of slavery and that oh, a absolutely. lot of this country not. was That's, was that's the next point I was going to make. Good. That is not to sugarcoat or whitewash any of that. Literally. But the fact is to focus on the basic humanity. You know, if, if, if we look at those who are reactionary, white nationalists, for example, why are they the way they are? They're generally that because they're insecure. They're fearful. They're scared of the of rapid pace of change. If I had been, if I would have been a European American male and been brought up to think that I was superior to other people because of race or gender or sexuality or religion, and then all of a sudden you see African Americans, Latinos, Asians, uh, people who are Jewish, people who are Muslim people who are gay, succeeding at a higher level than you are, then you're, then you're going to resort and retreat to these old defenses to make yourself feel better about yourself. Because once again, as I said, very few of those people say, what is it that I've done so that my life is so, if I might say, shitty? <laughs> well, you know, they, they don't want to examine what they've done. So, um, so, so I, I forgot to warn you, this is an FCC. So many of these reactions, of reactionaries in that way, if you understand the human psyche. So, yeah. 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 So um, I, I hope that that got caught and dumped. I forgot to warn you, this is an FCC channel, so we can't <laughs> say that word. I know you said cheaty. You, or sure shirty. Did. Sure you did. did. I you said did. Chitty, I, I said chitty, chitty, bang, bang. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank
thank you for that clarification. And if you've just tuned in and you're wondering who this delightful gentleman is, who sounds kind of like me, it's my new twin, different color skin, different gender, but basically uh, we are singing the same song and get, trying to get same you to name. drink our rose colored Kool-Aid. His Please name do. is Peter Lawson Jones. He's an actor, lawyer, uh, former as assemblyman, congressman. Uh, congressman in Ohio, Ohio, in Ohio, and he will soon be on your big screen. So let's talk about that and switch gears before I run out of time. As I knew would happen, we only have 19 minutes left. Did what? that go fast? Yes. <laughs> and we haven't even really talked about we Tom. We haven't talked about a man called Otto at all. I or, know. Or Tom Hanks. Or Tom I'm Hanks. So we're going to be the dish on Tom Hanks. So I got to do that. <laughs> Coming to theaters is this beautiful film. I can't wait to see it. Uh, tell me about the film. Tell me about Tom. Tell me about how you got on there. All of that. The rest of the time is yours. Well, I um, the film itself is is an extraordinary film. It's, it's going to be very popular. Even after the initial screenings in L.A., uh, the SAG before SAG after members, and then cast and crew. The reaction has been so positive and people are talking about Tom Hanks getting another Oscar nomination. Uh, the young woman who plays um, somebody who helps change his life, uh, also an Oscar nom. The, fi the film itself being up for an Oscar. The film is about a grumpy, irritable widower whose wife dies and he comes to the conclusion that he has nothing more to live for. And all of a sudden he meets this wonderful young family that moves into the neighborhood and it truly changes his life and his perspective. So it's a beautiful show. And, and talk about a diverse cast. It's about as diverse a cast as, as you could have in, in a movie uh, with some extraordinary performances. The director is the dream director. He's on the Hall of Fame team, Mark Forster. And Mark directed... Um, Halle Berry, and I've seen pictures of the two of you uh, together, uh, Dr. Marissa. He directed Halle Berry when she won her Oscar for uh, Monster's Ball. He's also directed A Quantum of, of Solace, the, the film with um, one of the James Bond films. He's directed Finding Neverland, uh, World War Z, The Kite Runner. Uh, he's quite, quite prolific and quite, quite talented and with just an absolute joy to work with. Uh, so it was fun doing this wonderful film. Wow. I love the kite runner. That was one of my favorite films for well, sure. Mark Forster, who's he, he was, what, what, a, what a pleasure it was to work with. Him. He's part uh, Swedish and part German. Oh. So there were times when he would get excited and it was sometimes a little challenging to understand what he was saying. Oh, how but, funny. But, and I'll always cherish this one moment. There's one we had concluded, uh, Tom, Tom and I call him T. Hanks, T. Hanks, T. Hanks and I, he calls me PJ. So T. Hanks and PJ had finished this one really emotional scene. And uh, Mark comes over to me and in between takes and says, Peter, he said, that scene you did with Tom, it was so beautiful. It made me cry. Oh. And I could have, you know, that was a mic drop moment. I said, okay, Mark Forster said, I'm good. This is great. But it was that kind of, it was a very affirming uh, a set and environment. Uh, and and I, one of the crew members said it was the best set he'd ever worked on. And, and, and Tom Hanks and Mark Forster, they set the tone at the top. And Rita mm -hmm. Wilson, who was a producer, Tom's wife. So um, I'm in about eight, nine scenes. Uh, there are moments where it's just uh, T. Hanks and me on, on camera. Um, so it, it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. And I can say this about Tom Hanks. Number one, he's an absolute genius when it comes to acting. As a matter of fact, I read an article uh, in which Mark Forster said the same thing. And Mark Forster has worked with a number of different um, high caliber, obviously, actors during the course of his career. And... Um, um, so he's he Tom, Tom Tom can see a scene even at the table read and knows instantaneously how to improve it. It's just a remarkable skill. 
I mean, his mind is always working and figuring out how a scene can be enhanced. And he's always spot on with it. Uh, wow. He also has a tremendous sense of humor. Uh, a sense of humor that reminded me, a, a quick wittedness that reminded me of Robin Williams. But uh, just that that quick, that smart. Um, and I love a, that. And then he's a better human being than he is uh, an actor. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, he is just as advertised. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate to develop, a, 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 I suppose, a bit of a friendship with him. We've exchanged a few dozen emails and even some old fa fashion correspondence. He likes, he's into typewriters and old fashioned typewriters, not the electronic kind, but the kind, the manual typewriters. And click, so click, his click. correspondence is typewritten. Wow. So I've got a couple of pieces of correspondence from him that obviously I'm going to cherish and have frames someday. And yeah. um, uh, when he threw out the first pitch at the Cleveland Guardians game, he invited uh, me to join him uh, at, in the Loge. And uh, so I brought along my wife and the only other people in the Loge, almost everybody else, went back with him 40 years to when he his his uh, acting career really took a sale and really picked up speed when he was at the Great Lakes Shakespeare Festival in Greater Cleveland. That's where he got his real start. And those friends have been friends of his for 40 years. That shows the kind of human being he is. He doesn't jettison the old to bring in the new. Mm. You're his friend, you're his friend for, for, for good. Wow. Uh, well, I'm so glad you put my name in front of him in an email. I hope that I'm going to wiggle my fingers that we cross paths because you, you're right. It, I, especially in your industry to find solid people who aren't insecure about who they are. And I think that's, uh, if, uh, if I were to synthesize how I separate successful actors with actors it's ones who they really don't need they know they bake their own cake compliments and awards all of that is icing on the cake yeah, absolutely but if you bake your own cake and you know you know you're not perfect but you're pretty darn good at uh, what you do because you've worked at it and you you hone it then the uh, you know you don't need to walk around looking well who likes me you know how many likes am i getting literally uh, to to um, to, those are, to define who I am. Those are so inconsequential. Um, I've been fortunate because at this stage, I've I've had the opportunity to work with three people who won Academy Awards and two that have won Emmys. Wow, who uh, else? And and so I've got to say, my interactions with all of them have been very very beyond pleasant. Uh, Matthew McConaughey, I was in White Boy Rick with him, and I had a great conversation with him. Um, Daniel Kaluuya uh, in Judas and the Black Messiah. It was the only time that my scene got cut from a major edit, left on editing room floor. That hurt. But the conversation I had with this very bright young actor uh, was so impressive. Uh, and, and then, of course, Tom Hanks. And then I, I, I was in uh, Alex Cross, and I had the opportunity in between takes to sit with the non-pre, the inestimable Cicely Tyson. And we chatted mm. for 20 minutes. She told me about her start in the business. And then one person, uh, I'll never forget my interaction with him, uh, was Michael Imperioli, of the, uh, who won his Emmy with The Sopranos. Uh, I, was in, I was in a TV show uh, I was a day player in a TV show called Detroit 187, which was an ABC uh, police procedural. Great show, but it didn't last long because it didn't resonate with that key demographic that all the ads are pitched to. But I, so I'm on set, and if you have a speaking role, you can you get treated better than the extras. The food is better. You sit in a certain area. So I was up there with. Um, a, a gentleman named Harold Crawford, who was one of the first black costumers in Hollywood. Mm. Uh, and my wife, we had traveled to Detroit to shoot the scene. Uh, Harold had helped costume me for this audition for the role of a homeless guy who goes up to Michael Imperioli's character, engages him in conversation. So we're sitting 
in the green room, so to speak. And one of the production assistants comes up to me and says, hey, you know, you're cast. You have a speaking role. You can go over to this other area and, and sit where Michael Imperioli is speaking. And so my um, wife, I kind of look and say, well, no, I don't need. My wife says, no, Peter, go ahead. Go, go over there. So I go over there very quietly and sit down. He's reading a book. I quietly sit down so it's not disturbing and draw attention. Next thing I know, he closes the book and engages me in conversation for the next 30 minutes. So I've been extremely fortunate to, to meet not just the, the best and most talented, but some of the nicest people in Hollywood. Mm. I really have. Yeah. And 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 to uh, give back to you what you gave to me when you said the first time meeting in the elevator, I think it is the law of attraction that when you do feel and know and love life, you can't help but attract people to that energy, which is another good reason to quit bah humbugging <laughs> and 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 continue this uh, the song of life sucking because really you could have a life that sucks for the rest of your life if you chose that. So choose. If you so choose, and choice is one of those, the uh, you know, the life tool that so many of us don't exercise. We keep thinking that it's, you know, what's happened to you instead of what's happened for you. For you. And uh, I, I'm going to name drop for just a second because I have been so fortunate in this show. This is actually Peter Lawson Jones. You are on my show on my 555th consecutive oh. week on the air, Fives. on camera. I'm going to have to play that number. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes, yes. It's a great number. And my, um, I've become friends with, do you remember Gilligan's Island? Yes. So Marianne, Don Wells. Uh, we became friends like you like you're becoming friends with these uh, people that you're working with. She was a guest on my show. We hit it off. She became a guest five times. And then I would go spend uh, Thanksgiving. We go to the races. She's really? on the other side. She died of COVID. Oh, so, I, I yeah. But um, Keiko Matsui, I don't know if you know, uh, number mm -hmm. one billboard. Yeah, yeah, we're twins. We found out we have 33 things in common, including, <laughs> you know, she's Japanese, I'm Chinese. Uh, two weeks apart, we were born. Our kids, uh, two daughters, same age. It's And we both got, uh, um, we got, I, I don't want to say screwed. I don't know if that's necessarily the best, <laughs> but can, let's just say, say we got. That on this TV show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I said Scrooged. <laughs> I said Scrooged, yes. But uh, yeah, so it is, isn't it wonderful that whatever you're doing in life, you can form relationships with anyone. And People who just because someone is on the big screen, this is another big beef I have, the way we put people on a pedestal that don't necessarily need to be there and they're just human as we are. And oftentimes they are probably even more insecure than we are. So that kind of stuff we got to get over. Well, it's, it's, it's so funny we're talking about putting people on a pedestal a little slightly abusing story of when, as I would be shooting scenes with Tom Hanks, I couldn't help but sometimes look at him and say, this is Tom Hanks and I'm shooting a scene with him. How does this ever happen? <laughs> and my, my youngest son who I got in the film as an extra and also uh, as my stand in for some in-between scenes, you know, we were, the film was shot in Pittsburgh. So we were staying in a hotel in Pittsburgh. And one evening he said to me, uh, dad, he said, did you ever think that you would be in a film with Tom Hanks? I said, I, you know, 15 years ago, I didn't think I would be acting, let alone, and, and I didn't think I'd be in a, a, a film, let alone a major film, let alone a major film with Tom Hanks. So, 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 but, but when you keep yourself open for the possibilities, I always tell when I'm asked to go to a school to talk to kids, I always tell them, whatever it is you want to do, network hard and then work even harder. So it, it's really through taking advantage of opportunities I had to meet people who are in the industry that I began to think a little differently, thinking, hmm, 
maybe because initially I only wanted to do stage acting and some voiceover work. And then all of a sudden I was in a, a TV show or a film and it just, and I started asking questions and following directions that were given to me by people who were further along in their acting journey than I was. And, and that's made all the difference. Um, but you, but you have to be open to the possibilities. You know, I, I think if I'm a poster child for anything, I'm a poster child for the fact that you can have acts two, three, four, and five, and that you don't just have to have one great, one fun thing that you do in your life. You can have many. I mean, I've already said that, and I'm putting this out there in the universe that come my next milestone birthday, I'd like to be an ambassador somewhere. Yeah. Why not? I, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to go to Ukraine or Russia, but someplace nice and warm where nobody's fighting. <laughs> and there's a, mm. and there's a, I want to go there, but um, and, and I'm yeah. going to towards that. I'll find some way to work towards that. Who knows if it'll happen or not? But I'm going to give it a the old college try. Why not? You know, and Why? this is the Absolutely. thing I've been saying. Go up. Hashtag up, which stands for unlimited possibilities. That is our life. That is just as much a possibility as no possibilities. So why would I go for no possibilities? So why would I choose that? Somebody's got to be in that movie with Tom Hanks. That's somebody's right. Somebody's <laughs> got to be the host, the, the MC, the hostess with the mostest like you. Somebody's got to be an ambassador to these countries. Why not us? Why not? Right? Why exactly. Not? Exactly. And we only have less than three minutes left. My last question that Which I always do? ask. Which shall we do? <laughs> what, to who or what are you most grateful for? I am. You're uh, rehearsing uh, your uh, academy. I, 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 you're I'm you're great, rehearsing I'm your great, academy I'm, speech. I'm great. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. And let's start there. I'm grateful to God for the blessings he's given me. I'm grateful for Charles and, and Diane Jones. We call it, Mar some people call her Margaret, some Diane. Though, because those, my parents were the ones who, again, laid the foundation and gave me what I needed to succeed. I, I always say that anything good I've done in life, I, I learned from them. Anything bad, I figured it all out on myself, all out by myself. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for my wife because she's been a tremendous supporter during my political career and, and, and during my acting career. And she's been an extraordinary partner in raising our three children. I'm so grateful for three children that I not only love because they're my kids, but I like, and I'm grateful for, for where they are in their journeys and that, you know, that, that they're, they're successful in doing what they could be doing and that they're happy and that they're healthy. Um, I'm grateful. For, I'm grateful for the community of friends that have surrounded me and supported me, who volunteered for my political campaigns, who gave generously to my political campaigns, who come to see me when I'm in a play, who buy a ticket if I'm in a movie, uh, and who always are encouraging. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful that I that you walked in the elevator uh, mm -hmm. at the same time I was, and that uh, you know I, I'll, I'll never forget it because it was kind of crowded out elevator and i said well you're spelt there's enough room for you to <laughs> maneuver your way here and then you shared with me something you know a transformation a mini transformation on your part and since february i believe it was that's right so I, i'm grateful for a world of opportunities that's great and, 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 and we have to stop now i know you're gonna keep going and and this is why you are successful because you lead with gratitude uh, if you could sign off with me, this is what I do at right, the end right. of every show. It's all about balance. Right. Peace, peace in, in. Peace, peace out. out. World peace through inner peace. This is Dr. Marissa reporting live from my loving room with an amazing man. Go see him in the theater this coming holiday season with Tom Hanks, a man called Otto. Thank you so much, Peter Lawson James, for coming and being you. And that is it for it. this episode of Eight. Uh, take my advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. We will see you tomorrow 
here on KCAA, the station that leaves no listener behind.